So now we have to replenish that wealth. And the way I think you need to do that is by looking at discovery. Do you do this for all of your portfolio? No, you do this for a small piece of your portfolio because the discovery wealth that you will create will be very significant if you make a large discovery. Now, why do I su suggest discovery? Well, as I mentioned before, you know, I've been, in, I've been a fund manager, I've been a professor of investment, so I've taught the theory and I've walked the walk in the investment world. And I recognize that if you pick a particular style, that style, that investing style, again, it could be growth or it could be value, it could go out of favor for a very long time. And of course, that happened to me in, in, in one of my stints on Wall Street. And so I wanted to find a, a, a sphere that would be exciting for people, where they could learn a tremendous amount, where I could teach them a tremendous amount. And discovery is absolutely an untouched investment space. Discoveries happen up front. Oftentimes they're serendipitous. Now, what I mean by that is that you don't, you know, you get something you don't always expect, but lots of times it's good. And so when you're out there looking for discoveries, sometimes you find things that you don't expect to see. But if you're not out there looking, you won't find them. It's an adjunct. Discovery investing is an adjunct to your retirement funds. It's n you don't do it 100%. You make it part of your portfolio. So I would say that if you're considering this, you take 5% or 10% or whatever you feel comfortable with, and you put it into the discovery space. And by that, I mean you buy stocks that you think have the potential for discovery. Very often, but especially in this environment where commodities, for example, have really been hit very hard. You've seen oil has gone from $147 to $37. Now it's back up to about $70 as, as I uh, speak. So the, oftentimes, the best time to invest in discovery is when, the, uh, when, when it's a contrarian environment. And it's very much independent of the business cycle. So these are two really good things to have. It's hard to be a contrarian, but I, I learned that in my career on Wall Street, and it's something that you, you deal with, you know, have a feel. For example, today natural gas is selling for about $4 a thousand cubic feet, and it's way, way undervalued. And it's unloved, it's unwanted, but a discovery in natural gas will create great wealth. So that's just an example that I give of, uh, of discovery investing. The other factor that's probably the most important for all of you here today is that it has a very large wealth creation potential relative to traditional strategies. And why is that? That's because you're at the front end. You're at the front end when there's almost no value in the stock that you're looking at because maybe the discovery hasn't yet been made. And so that once you make that discovery, whether it's a drill hole or whether it's a, a clinical trial in the biotech arena, or maybe it's uh, Apple's new you know, iPhone system, I mean, it goes across the spectrum. And once the public realizes you have a discovery, they will bid the stock, ir almost irrespective of, uh, of uh, how, how good the discovery is. Why do we need discovery? Well, I've, I've touched a little bit on this, but China is still a very major player in the world. Uh, people have said, well, you know, you know there's 1.3 billion Chinese and, and um, China ha has not decoupled. They're going through a difficult situation. But I went to school in China 41 years ago, and I've watched China grow. And over the last 40 years, China has become a major player on the world stage, and they're not going to stop. So we have this global quality of life cycle. It began in China under Deng Xiaoping in 1979. It will last another two to three decades. Once we get through this recession, you're going to see growth in China. You're going to see growth in India what we call the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, they will all start to grow again. And that growth will be predicated on their, the people in those countries wanting a higher quality of life. It will require the discovery process. We will have to discover minerals, energies, energy uh, uh, commodities. We'll have to figure out new ways of building um, agricultural commodities, new discoveries in the ag, ag space. And, uh, of course, Canada is, is, is way ahead in many of these areas. Also, what we see happening today that makes discovery important is what we call resource nationalism. It's the second point on the slide here. And in, in this case, you know that just as an example, but it's happening everywhere, but Russia disallowed foreign control of uh, their companies, of Russian companies, in July of 2008. They suspended natural gas distribution to the Ukraine and Western Europe in 2008. 
And as of June 2009, the U.S. government decided that they would buy all of their uranium from the Russians. So there's this sort of resource nationalism happening now, and, and uh, it's going to mean that there's a higher premium on discoveries because if you take a look at Venezuela, they're nationalizing everything, and Iran is, is uh, uh, doing the same type of thing. Finally, we need discovery because there are 87 million, I estimate, 87 million relatively impoverished U.S. and Canadian baby boomers. Now, I'm entering the baby boomer phase, so I, I know what I'm talking about here. Many of these baby boomers have just been through the most gut-wrenching wealth destruction cycle of their lives, where they thought they were going to retire in two or three years in, in a comfortable lifestyle, and they found out now they have 50%. 30%, 20% less wealth. And so they need to be in the discovery space. They, many of them don't know it yet. But this is why I go out and speak about this, um, this, this uh, uh, particular investment discipline. They must create additional wealth due to the pension, their pension declines, the vanishing safety nets that we see, particularly in the U.S., the decline of fiat currency, and you all know what I mean by that, the decline of the dollar relative to other currencies and relative to commodities, and uh, through inflation and through tax increases. Okay, so what about China and India? They have what we call a nascent or beginning QOL cycle, quality of life cycle. And this is where people are now learning about televisions and cars. You know, I lectured in China in the 60s, and I went back there and talked to the Chinese government in 1995, and I, I took my wife with me, and... and uh, we asked the Chinese government, you know, uh, what is the goal of the government of China? This was 1995, and the official guide said, the goal of the government of China is to electrify every home, and that means one light bulb in every home. Now, I can assure you, now, the Chinese want color TVs in every home. That's the quality of life change that I'm talking about. And you have to have discovery to be able to do that. You have to create wealth to be able to do that kind of increase of quality of life. So, uh, you know, it is not now dead. This is from uh, Professor Jared Diamond. He, he had a New York Times op-ed piece in January of 2008. Um, uh, Jared Diamond is famous for Blood, Germs, and Steel. It was a book he wrote, and I recommend to everyone in here that you, you should read that because it's really about this increasing quality of life in the world. This is what he said, and I qu I'm quoting him now. If Indian as well as China were to catch up, with Canadians and Americans and Europeans, world consumption rates would triple. Okay, now if world consumption is going to triple, you better be discovering the kinds of assets that can support that tripling, whether it's copper or whether you're growing more wheat, uh, you're finding out how to, how to create more food, how to process more food. These are all the discovery issues. If the whole world, if the whole developing world were suddenly to catch up, world consumption rates would increase by 11 times. So where we are today in the U.S. and Canada primarily and in Western Europe, you can multiply that consumption rate by 11, and that's the kind of, of, of consumption we would have to have. It would be, Gerald Diamond, Professor Diamond says, it would be as if the world population ballooned to 72 billion. Now, I, the only thing I can really stand up here today and assure you all of is that the quality of life cycle has not been derailed. Once people understand that there's a better life available, I can assure you the Chinese do, I can assure you there's an awakening in India and in Brazil and in Russia, they will not cease until they have that better quality of life. Professor Diamond says, some optimists claim we could support a world with 9 billion people. That's the current forecast for the population in 2050. But I haven't met anyone crazy enough to claim that we could support 72 billion. Think about that, 72, the effect of 72 billion people all desiring automobiles and televisions and, and a better home and, and the nutrition necessary to live. So discovery investing will, will, will be only become more critical as we go down the road. And now I think we talk about some good examples. The strange case of oil, of petroleum. Uh, it's, a, it's a dirty word in, in Washington now because of the environmental impact of some of these uh, uh, fuels. Uh, 